Hello, loyal uh, Sophia listeners and viewers. Um, in a moment, you'll be seeing both myself and Dan Kaufman in a dialogue we recorded, but I just wanted to put on a quick programming note. Um, I bring up a person and a particular film review early in this dialogue that becomes rather central to what we end up talking about. And I was unable to remember uh, the name of the reviewer, and I didn't have it written down because I'm bad at doing this. So his name is Robbie Collin of The Telegraph in London, and he tweets at, at Robbie Reviews, and we're going to be supply a link to uh, the review that we're going to discuss. Um, I'd like to also apologize just for my hair. It's been a long pandemic. I uh, still haven't done anything about it. I'm sorry. This would be a good one to just do audio. Uh, we're not the prettiest show, but, you know, still better than old Statler and Waldorf over there. So anyway, that's that. And thank you. And see you. David Allinger, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Dan. Um, welcome to everyone uh, in the Sophia audience, uh, Meaning of Life TV, TV. This is the Sophia program uh, available on streaming video and audio bo- podcast. Uh, I'm the host, Daniel Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University, and I also uh, edit and publish a, an online magazine called The Electric Agora. I'm here with uh, one of my regular and much beloved partners, David Ottlinger. David Ottlinger, I think I would describe at this point as a independent scholar, cultural and political commentator, as well as uh, one of the original uh, contributors to the Electric Agora. And um, uh, I'm very happy to have you, David. Well, thank you. I was, you always manage to make me sound very lofty. Well, you know. This is all about making us look good, David. I mean, you know, <laughs> about glam, the glamour and the glitz of being a media personality. Um, <laughs> so um, many of my conversations uh, with David uh, have been along the lines of political philosophy. This is one of David's main interests. We've done really um, in-depth programs. We did a two-part series on liberalism, which still I think is one of the high points of the things I've done on blogging heads. Um, but David was also a really interesting um, uh, cultural critic. Uh, he does, he's done some really, really interesting pieces for the electric Agora in depth analyses of you know, TV shows and film. And we had a conversation about the moving from t- of TV shows to sort of cinematic values that I thought was very interesting. And we're going to w- talk in that area of of things today. Um, and specifically, we're going to talk about the, the use of visual effects um, uh, in television and in film. Um, but more than that, the, the relationship or the difference between um, the use of effects, uh, special effects and pra- what we'll call practical effects. So sort of CGI type computer effects and practical versus practical effects, which would be everything from models to actual people dressed up in outfits. Um, and David has some really interesting thoughts about the relationship between these, when the vis- when the visual effects work and when they don't. Um, part of this was inspired, I think, am I correct, David, by the Irishman and the Irishman's use of the de-aging technology? I was kind of... Is that what spurred the... Was that the spark that got you thinking, I want to talk about this? It it wasn't just one thing. It was this repeated experience that I kept having, um, which the first time I remember noticing it was um, I was watching Star Trek, the original series on uh, Netflix, and the Netflix one is um, from this, is, uh, I, I don't remember what they call it, but it's sort of um, revised. or Like an enhanced back. like an enhanced edition? Yeah. Or like what they, they did went, to the Star Wars. They did that, I think Luke mm-hmm. Lucas did that to the Star Wars. 
original. Right. Yeah. And that's, uh, it was, I, it was put on, uh, I were, this edition came out, um, around that time. And for a while they were doing, doing that to lots of other movies too, going back and putting digital effects in to movies that were made before the digital era. Um, actually, and South Park, it's one of the many things to the glory, the greater glory of South Park ended that with a really funny episode complaining about it. And then the studios got the hint and stopped doing that. Can you remember but, another instance other than Star Trek and Star Wars of this? A particular, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss to think of another one, but can you think of another one where they went back and supposedly they were going to do it to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, uh, wow. Um, Yes, uh, Blade Runner. Um, oh, it's fairly really. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Ridley Scott keeps changing it, but it's fairly subtle, and he seems to have done it more intelligently. But he so has. If I go and watch a, a contemporary director's cut of Blade Runner, it'll have uh, visual effects added. Yes, they're very subtle. Um, he took things. He took things out, like he took strings and models out. Uh, they did it to the Wizard of Oz. Same thing. Uh, they took out the string over the cowardly lion's tail. Um, yeah, okay. yeah. So it's it, it it it. There was a little spur there. Okay. But the Star Trek one was more invasive. It was really they substantively changed a lot of stuff. Um, and the one thing <laughs> uh, which really stuck out to me is the Gorn. Um, <clears throat> which there's a famous episode arena where captain Kirk ends up uh, fighting this big lizard monster, alien race, obviously. <clears throat> um, and it's a ridiculous sixties costume is, you know, most of the things on star Trek wear big, big rubber suit. And when they actually fight, they almost fight in slow motion. Right, because the a, guy can't move around in the suit. Right. So it's <laughs> it's a, like this sort of, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. And I, I'm i guessing they did that with the intention to speed it up, and then they looked at it, and it didn't work. So anyway, um, he has these big, massy, metal-looking eyes. Yeah. Um. And in in the revised edition, obviously the, they couldn't do this back in the '60s. But in in the you know revamped version, he blinks, and you have these obviously digital eyelids going. Oh my god! Oh and my god! Every time it happened, <laughs> it was like I got poked in the eye, or somebody put their hand between my face in the television. So it was like, wait, no, I wanted to watch Star Trek. Why are you putting in, why am I suddenly watching not Star Trek? This new show that you've created by putting things into uh, an old show from the sixties. And I kept having that experience. I had the, so the dark crystal was this show on Netflix where they really made a big deal out of, um, so another thing I wanted to note was, you know, we're now at a particular moment in the history of film, uh, where the combination of digital and practical effects is now pretty commonplace. Uh, when the Lord of the Rings came out, it was a big deal that they were putting together both practical and digital effects. And around that era, like their pre- the prequels movies were overwhelmingly green screen and digital, and then there were other movies that were. You'd have entire uh, characters that were digital, interacting mm-hmm. with characters that were real. Like famously, the Jar Jar Binks character. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to start going on that. Everybody's yeah. got their favorite lamb jokes about that, but it was yeah. it was remarkable in that you you had a digital character interacting with a live person. Now, let me just one thing about that, though, that I wanted, this is something I wanted to ask you, which I neglected in our private conversation. Mm. It's really who framed Roger Rabbit, where that started, is mm-hmm. it not? Now yeah, there, was, there, but there, there, there wasn't an attempt to make the thing look realistic. It was, it was a cartoon character, but I thought there it was very effective. Um, and I think over, overall people deem that a very effective 
film, right? Yeah. So yeah, what, what, what's, why is that not jarring in a way that Jar Jar Binks is? And, and maybe maybe right. lead us into what some of your ideas are about what, what's at issue here. Right. So sometimes practical and uh, digital effects. So we're now at this moment where it's common. When when Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out, it was deliberately ambitious. Like, it was revolutionary, no one, right? Yeah. Right. And – that was what, part of why the studio did it. It was um, going to catch everyone's attention. And even much later than that, the, when Lord of the Rings came out, people thought it was very novel that there were these digital effects. Gollum was very digital. And then they had big practical suits and props and things like that. Um, but now it's just kind of, we take it for granted. It's, it's all around us. Um, and um, tons of things uh, tons of movies, tons of, of TV shows have some combination of the two. Uh, the Dark Crystal is a really interesting example where the Netflix, the people who made that built a whole bunch of sets, built physical puppets, uh, really did a lot of stuff, but then they felt um, the need to go put in little digital somethings. So let me ask you about that, about the Dark yeah. Crystal. So I haven't watched the show. I am mm-hmm. a fan of the film, the original mm-hmm. film. The original film is, of course, a Jim Henson production, and it's all practical effects. It's all puppets. Um, and even today looks spectacular. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it, in other words, there was nothing deficient. Mm-hmm. Do you know why the makers of the show, who obviously were, you know, obviously the entire inspiration is Jim Henson. Mm-hmm. Do you know why they decided that that 100% practical puppet effects were not sufficient? Do you know, or are you, or, or is that part of what you're sort of trying to get at, is that we now have gotten to the point to where we feel it's not sufficient practical effects? Yeah, I mean, it's almost, I think... It's now so natural to put in little digital effects. It's so possible. Um, you know, they're used to having the people who can do it. And, you know, that I think I would almost be surprised if there was a real thought process. They just. It's in, the, it's the, in, tools. The, air, it's in the air now. It's so you don't even. It, yeah. 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 But watching that show, I had that same experience where it was you know it's sort of like it's almost physical like i'm you know they they they're these real puppets and i loved watching these puppets there's a sequence which is so great of one of our characters named hop just getting up in the morning and they rig they were being ambitious and doing something where they obviously had to rig up a lot of stuff so we see his little feet go into his little shoes and then he sits down to eat breakfast and he has a little plate of porridge and then he puts, he's mashing the porridge in his little face and um, then he drops some on his shirt and he goes like, ugh. And, you know, it, it, it just feels wonderful and you get involved in the tactile feeling. And they did this little thing where they, they blink. They put in little digital blinks. Uh, uh, just like the Gorn, it's actually it was the same. Yeah. Thing. It was a blinking. Yeah, um, and they put in little digital elements around the frame. Uh, they're these big monster characters, uh, and they put in little digital tongues. Um, Interesting. And every time I saw it, it was this weird. Like I had to. It pulls you out of the experience. Yeah, pulls me right out, and I um, find myself sort of scanning the frame, and it's sort of like it puts you in this hyper vigilant kind of state where I'm like, is it real or not? Uh, I can't trust my own eyes, and it's really disorienting. So I and I've had this with not just those two things, but several. And um, what made me realize that other people were feeling it too was cats. So there was this huge flop. Um, uh, of a movie that this was a, an adaptation to screen of the old musical cats in the musical. 
people dress up in these sort of furry skin suits and dance around and behave and I think I think the costumes are the only and makeup are the only thing good about the Broadway. Uh, (laughs) At the time, it was quite spectacular. I remember when it first came out on Broadway. I'm I'm old enough that you know I went to see it when it first came out, and um, it was quite astonishing the makeup and costumes. The 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 musical itself is shit, but but that that was the best thing about it. And they took that one thing in the film and they ruined it, right? I mean, yeah. It was so it, in the film they do it with real people and uh they gave them they made the the catening of the people digital so they gave them instead of them wearing physical fur on set or suits and makeup they gave them digital fur in post um after the film was shot and not only did everyone hate the film Everyone agreed that the film was sunk, just irredeemably sunk by the fact that they did digital effects, that they did real people with this sort of digital paint all over them or, you know, smeared onto them. Um, There just wasn't a critic who didn't say that. And there's a little video of the BBC where uh, I was listening to a critic talk about this and um, I'll link to it uh, where he was saying, you know, there's uh, a certain amount of theorizing about this. And it, he was making the point that the, the way the, the film was made was working against the effects and the effects were move, working against the way the movie was made because not only did you have these people who just did not look real, but the style of the director who had recently done Les Miserables um, in a very realistic uh, period, correct style, um, his sort of tendency as a director was to put the camera right in front of the character and have actors emote right down the camera, down the barrel, looking right at you, very sort of free-flowing emotion. And when you're doing that, and you have this person who's been sort of made to look fake, and you're supposed to have this earnest emotional reaction to it, it gets really, it's like I said, that poked in the eye feeling where you're looking at things two different ways, and you just get pulled out. And um, it was a really interesting discussion. And apparently this critic I mentioned, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, um, mentioned that Lacan, the French psychoanalyst, talked about um, (laughs) when there's an image that's sending us two different signals at once, it can be intensely disturbing. So uh, scary clowns. Mm. Um, the clown is projecting, ostensibly projecting, uh, <clears throat> cheerful, friendly, inviting, um, safe for children. And unless it's John Wayne Gacy, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Or, or um, I remember Sweet Tooth from the Twisted Metal games, and or the Joker. Uh, yeah, when it's he's he's ostensibly or ironically projecting uh, friendliness, cheerfulness, but actually he's dark and dangerous and wants us to know that he's dangerous and projecting danger and violence. Uh, It comes off as disturbing and people are fascinated by that disturbing duality. And there's something about these combinations of digital and practical effects. There's the same sort of, psychological clash that they seem to inspire in, in, in us. And um, so is the idea that there's kind of, one can give a kind of a Lacanian account of why this com this sort of combination of visual of, of practical and visual effects is sort of jarring aesthetically. Is that the sort of the idea that you're, that you're working yeah. with, that there's a sort of an aesthetic implication of the sort of Lacanian account of. Right. I, 
I felt watching the Dark Crystal that the puppets and the sets and all the little careful things they made wanted me to view the show one way, and then the little digital effects uh, wanted me to view it another. And I couldn't do both at once, and it was distressing, and it was like you wanted them to just pick what you're doing and then, you know, go with that. Because yeah. I'll watch either show, but you have to pick one. Let's get all the... um. Let's get all the examples on the table before we go deeper into the principle. So I'm just thinking of you, and I want to finish, I want the last exam, uh, example we talk about to be the Irishman because that one I found okay. particularly um, uh, troublesome and to a certain yeah. degree really damaged the movie's um, mm-hmm. Im- Im- imp- impression with me. But let me just give a few other examples and, and so that we have them all on the table and then we can refer to them when we talk about the principle. So one of the early examples of the use of CGI um, in television science fiction, I think one of the earliest was uh, Babylon 5. And I don't mm-hmm. know if this is a show that you've ever, that you ever watched. Yeah. Um, um, but there, the practical and the CGI effects are pretty much segregated. So the CGI was used almost entirely for the space battles. And even though the CGI didn't look so great, the, the space battles were so well choreographed, um, and you could choreograph things in a way that you couldn't do with practical effects, that the battle's overall impression is really quite spectacular. And I think, I think they've won awards for this. Um, another example where there's more integration would be Farscape. I don't know if you saw Farscape. Mm-hmm. Now, there is another Jim Henson. Mm-hmm. But again, the practical and the CGI, I think, are segregated, right? Some of them are puppets, and some of so the ones that are puppets are not CGI'd, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, now, or, or directly yeah. interacting with anything that's CGI, or very much. There are a few things in Babylon Five, but very, very few. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, and so then, and and then another example that I was thinking of. Um, which you already mentioned, and, and one that works and one that doesn't, and maybe this will be a good case study for us, right? I think it really, the integration works in Lord of the Rings. Yes. I don't think it works in the Hobbit pictures. Yes. Peter Jackson lost creative control, actually. And maybe um, there's something yeah. in there that will make, the, that help us articulate the principle at work, right? Why did it yeah. work? Because in both cases, they're integrated. But right. in one case it works, and in the other case it doesn't. Right. So um, that's that was the thing I started struggling with is, um, I and then the other uh, while we're getting examples on the table, um, the Avengers movies. Oh yeah, there they work. Um, it works. Yeah. yeah, and the Avengers movie are uh, presenting people uh, full CG characters, motion cap characters interacting with live action actors. And nevertheless, I find it worked in a dramatic way. Uh, in fact, worked very, very well. Um, I even think it worked in some cases where it was a little bit obvious. Like, mm-hmm. I thought that the obviously CGI'd skinny, weak Steve Rogers in the first Captain America, mm-hmm. I did not find that distracting. Um, mm-hmm. I did, that did not pull me out of the experience. Um, Whereas the now let's do the Irish and the Irishman it really did, um, yeah. and um, um, so let me just say one thing about the Irishman and then I'd like you to say whatever you know you want to say about it and then let's talk about the principle itself. Um, all I could think of through the Irishman was why the fuck after you have the example of the Godfather two, why would you not simply use other actors to represent so explain I, I, what thought they, it, I thought it was lazy actually explain what they did well what they did was they used cgi to de-age robert de niro and joe pesci and the other actors creating so it's, a, an it's a story it's a story about these guys who know each other over a really long period of time so it jumps from early in their life when they first meet to later in their life where they're i mean they're young men when they first, they're like 30 when they first meet, and then they're, it follows them all the way into it's their To the point that, that the De Niro character's in an old age home. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, interestingly, when they made him, they aged him to make him look even older than he really is, they used yeah. practical effects, right? Yeah, right. But to de age him, they used um, uh, uh, visual effects, and I thought that it made them all look so odd. 
that mm-hmm. I just wish that they had instead chosen to do it the way the Godfather did it, and that is to use different actors, um, which I thought was much more effective and gave the opportunity, really would, would then give the opportunity to, to the, the actors to really, really exercise their stick, their trade, right? Their skill. Um, um, you know, the young Robert De Niro in Godfather two has to act in a way that's commensurate with the Marlon Brando older version. You have to believe he's going to grow up to be Marlon Brando. And it yeah. works, man. Not, yeah. I mean, it's considered the two is considered. So many people think it's even better than one. Yeah. Um, and I, I was disappointed that Scorsese just, and of all the people to do this, I, I was really surprised, especially since Scorsese has been on record, you know, dissing the Marvel movies. So, so what the hell are you doing? <laughs> there's a story that was going around at the time when he made Gangs of New York um, that uh, this could be apocryphal, but I'll tell it anyway, um, that George Lucas told him, because he built that big set which is there's a big street set with like five different streets meeting um, in 19th century New York. And he went in like they did with uh, rear window back in the day and physically built a huge set. And um, apparently George Lucas. uh, So the story goes, told him, you don't need to do this. You can just do a green screen and make it all in computers. And Scorsese told him off and, told him that all his movies looked like crap and he wasn't going to make a movie that way. So, I mean, he's had this kind of anti-CG, or at least if you look at the way he really makes his movies, he's deliberately done more practical things when he he's needed certain sorts of visuals. Yeah, um, yeah I had the same experience with The Irishman. You, find it as jar- you found it as jarring as I did? It was the, that same old feeling of, I want to see Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro and you're not letting me see them. You're, you're, you're obscuring them from me by adding all this digital aging to their faces. And like there, there's a scene where these two characters first meet and they're, they're over his truck is broke down. The gas station. Yeah. Gas station. And they just meet over as typical of Scorsese movies, the dialogue doesn't have a lot of content. It's more the the context that has the sort of content. A lot so of nonverbal just, communication that that communicates yeah. a lot of what's yeah yeah I agree yeah. Um, um, he, so and messing with the faces affects that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It, so everything is just in their faces, and the kind of actors they both are was you look closely for that subtle shift of expression uh, in, in their faces. Um, they're not big showy physical actors or um, they're very subtle. And, you know, years of watching Scorsese movies, you're trained to latch on to that little subtle stuff. And when they go in there and, and then mess with their faces, it's like, I, I, I palpably wished I could see what Robert De Niro was acting. Yeah. And I felt like I couldn't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was a really uh, stark example of this sort of phenomenon, and a real yeah. shame also because otherwise, I think it's one of his best films. Yeah, um, um, I, I, you know, I think I think barring that, it would be a masterpiece. Uh, in some ways, I think it's better than Goodfellas. Um, hmm. I always thought Goodfellas was actually a little overrated. Um, um, Goodfellas to me didn't do that much more than Mean Streets had already done. Um, um, and I thought in some ways Mean Streets did a little bit better. I, I, I think, I still think Harvey Keitel is his best leading man. Um, um, I've always thought that, but, um, um, it really did lower it in my estimation. I mean, it, it had a tangible effect. Um, let's talk then. Let's, let's get on. I'd like you to, to now articulate sort of what you think is at work. You know, what is the principle? When does it work and when does it not? And so, so how does the Lacanian principle apply aesthetically in your view with regard to this? Yeah, so uh, just to sort of circle where we are in the dialectic, there's this, uh, lots of us are seeing this clash between practical and digital effects, but it can't be that you just can't put digital and practical effects together because 
some movies like The Avengers or Lord of the Rings seem to pull it off. So why do I sometimes love it and have no problem? And why do I sometimes feel like I've been poked in the eye? And so let's go to the examples where it does work and try to look at them more closely and find some answers there. Because uh, if you look at uh, The Avengers... And if you look at the Lord of the Rings, both of them are incorporating digital and practical effects, but they're, the aesthetics of both films are wildly different. And what I think really underlines that is uh, look at the physical costumes on the characters who have no digital <coughs> anything. I, I find myself thinking of Frodo's costume um, he was almost wearing, like, almost always wearing um, something that looked sort of uh, maybe late 18th, maybe early 19th century, sort of the Gainsborough times. And the, um, it was like heavy cloth. Um, and it, it had sort of like a white shirt with lace on it, um, sort of modestly aristocratic. Um, but a lot of. Uh, thought when went into it um very, it text, seemed, very texture uh texture yes. um rich uh-huh. and the feet were, pra- were were prosthetics they were not yeah. visual they were not cgi feet and they didn't highlight the feet too much yeah. they kind of yeah. didn't want to show the feet too much because it but it was clearly supposed to be very feel very real very realistic and then look at Gollum. Gollum was, of course, the, the digital character, um, but he was rendered in a pretty realistic way. So Gollum's uh, sort of, I don't know how you, amphibian looking, but humanoid, um, sort of gray skin, very large eyes, sharp teeth. Um, and well, Sir, the actor was actually filmed live wearing a yeah. suit. And then the so so every aspect of his physical movement and expression was then translated into the CGI shell that was put over him. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's a it. I mean, if you see the real Andy Circus, it's very different from uh, you know even just the face is very very different, and then the physicality is totally different. So I mean, it's a really radical. Um, digital intervention it yeah. changes uh, thoroughgoing. Um, but what they ended up with at the end of it was something that I think you were supposed to accept as pretty real. Um, I it, think it worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he looked, um, he was living in caves and eating fish and, he always looked like kind of damp and like the, he had stuff, dirt or whatever smeared on his skin. It was rendered in such a way that somebody thought about, okay, if he were really doing these things and living in these environments, yeah. what would he look like? What would it, what would it feel like? Yeah. You know, you all, you could almost smell him yeah, oh, yeah. in some of these frames. Yeah. And, um, and he had some little, he wore like it's rags basically, yeah, but yeah. Th- those were also rendered in a really realistic way. And they, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is they showed, they didn't, they weren't arrogant. Um, as much as possible. And it became less possible as the movies went on because it became more of a character. They hid him in shadow or, didn't have him right in the middle of the frame. And what, particularly when he's moving around where it's sort of more obviously digital, they didn't like to have him do that right into the camera or, you know, he'd be off in the corner of the frame. And we, we'd have uh, Frodo and Sam in the frame somewhere else. So our eyes are bouncing back and forth. So you're not just staring at him. Uh, they draw the eye away and, you know, things like that where it, there was a, those decisions all reflected an understanding that you don't want to break the illusion, right? Um, you want to be very careful about not having him look like a cartoon character. Um, we should accept, our eyes should accept Gollum. 
in the same way we accept Frodo and Sam, who are played by real physical actors. Right. Right. Um, <clears throat> contrast Thanos. So now the Avengers, yeah. The Avengers. So the big villain in Thanos is also a motion captured uh, character where we have an actor acting in a motion capture suit, and then that's put onto this totally digitally rendered character. Um, so it's the, the same technology. Um, when we start, uh, I forget what the name of that one was. They all have, uh, but the Thanos movie, the, what the name of what is the, the second Avenger or the third Avengers movie, not Endgame, but the one before, um, infinity war. Yeah, yeah. Infinity war. Uh, we start right on Thanos and he just, it happens to be dark, but uh, he turns around and he's right there and he's talking right to us. He's basically talking to the audience, um, even though he's ostensibly talking to our characters and he says, I know what it is to lose. It's very thematically important. And we're with him a lot, sometimes in full bright light. Um, and he's, He's, you know, uh, right in the middle of the frame. They're shooting him the same as all the other characters. Um, Not hidden at all. And the whole design of the character is also completely obvious, or completely opposite of um, the sort of Gollum character where he has this very, I don't know, super villainy, uh, exaggerated... Obviously, uh, the whole they're not, design. They're not hiding them. They're not, they're not, you know, and yet it still well, works. And yet well, it also works, right? Yeah. His suit um, doesn't look like they thought uh, about what armor would be effective. It's They thought about what would look interesting or imposing right. or. Uh, and somewhat to try to remain true to the actual comic also to a certain I'm point. sure. Yeah. 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 But. In the comics, too, I'm sure they were not trying to make him look like a real, uh, <laughs> you know, suit of armor, but trying to make something that was sort of visually interesting and yeah. that evoked his character characteristics. Yeah. And uh, yeah. um, it was appropriate in the aesthetic sense. And yeah. it's, it's a, a totally different thought process than whoever was designing Frodo's costume, right? Or what Gollum you know, is on Gollum's skin. It's those aren't aesthetic de- decisions. They just think, what what did this real thing right. in this real environment? What would it be? And then this is much more um, guided by aesthetics and um, just what would look interesting. And also the nature of the character itself. Obviously, nothing like Thanos and nothing like Gollum exists um, in the real world, but. Uh, Gollum isn't so different from a human yeah. that um, he's totally sort of unprecedented in our experience. Thanos is uh, like nine feet tall or, you know, absolutely massive in terms of muscle where he looks um, uh, uh, you, you know, just non-human yeah. and uh and he's purple yeah you know, a pretty uh bright shade of purple which is you know no end uh, well I don't know. so Nothing. what you don't want but it, it might be easy then to sort of tempting to conclude that okay well what this means is that you know this works when it's used in highly sort of fantastical context but not otherwise the problem is that we have examples like the hobbit movies mm-hmm. um where it didn't, or like the 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 the, the prequel, the Star Wars prequels, where it really doesn't work, and mm-hmm. so that's not going to be the the, the fu- that's not going to be the fault line along which the principle applies, right? Let's just call it the right. Lacanian principle. It's got to be something else, right? Mm-hmm. And so, what do you maybe start bringing us towards? What do you think that something else is? So, uh, yeah, you have to pick how you're supposed how you want the audience to view it do you want the 
audience to accept it as real uh, in the way we, we accept, I think are supposed to accept and hopefully do accept. And I did accept Gollum as being really there, the same as the physical actors. And I sort of interacted with him in that way. Um, Thanos, we're never really supposed to believe we have where it's engaging us in a way that allows us to imagine him into existence. And the whole story itself um, is narratively is very sort of fantastical in the sense of um, good and evil and these big reckonings between heroes and villains and uh, very arch kind of sort of style um, compellingly, but um, very different sort of style. And, um, the trouble is when you try to go back and forth and when you have something that you need to imagine and then something that is when there's an effect that is sort of engaging you in the imagined way and sort of engaging you of the real way. Um, and that's, I would say it's not just in the individual, but it's also in the, in the context. So, Mm-hmm. I would include in the principle that I think you're starting to sort of articulate having Jar Jar Binks, an entirely CGI mm-hmm. character, interacting with live characters doesn't work in the way that Gollum interacting with live mm-hmm. characters works. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so it's not just that you're getting a mixed message about the individual. You're getting a mixed message about the ensemble, right? The, 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 the group that, that, that they're mm-hmm. in. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, one of, part of the thing is that um, makes Jar Jar Binks not work is that he just seems to be a cartoon character, not just not in the sense that he's digitally rendered, but in the way he behaves and speaks. And um, he seems sort of like he's in the wrong movie. And then, yeah, but then why does Roger Rabbit work? Because, because that's the whole premise of it. That's yes. the damn premise of it. Right. Cartoon world interacting with real world. That's not the premise of Star Wars, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's, they're supposed to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, and that's the whole point is you have hard boiled detective, uh, noir wearing, wearing his, um, uh, you know, uh, suit and coat and it's Raymond uh, Chandler out, outfit, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, Raymond Chandler, uh, kind of stuff. And then next to him is a big Bugs Bunny, right? This- yeah, right. Uh, it's you're supposed to go like, you know, be disoriented, and then they play that up for yucks all through the film. So the mix, um, but you know, actually that requires a modification of the Lacanian principle, right? Because mm-hmm. there are contexts in which you can deliberately mm-hmm. induce um, these contradictory effects and it'll work, right? Right. The, the, again, the scary clown um, can work and, you know, the, can be compellingly disturbing, but right. that's, that's when, that's when the artist is aware of the effect and deliberately making it and making it in a narrative context that makes sense. The Joker is supposed to be disturbing. So the fact that he looks like he's smiling and he's really frowning, um, that's he's because he thinks everything is a dark joke, right? So it's both funny and not funny. Um, so it makes good sense. Of, that's the reaction we want to have to that character is to be disturbed by him. He seeks to disturb us. That's his raison d'etre, really. Um, The Dark Crystal. The Dark Crystal, I felt, referring again to the Netflix show, not the older film, for the most part, we were supposed to be imagining. Uh, We were... We, you know, it's a puppet. Puppets don't try to look like real things. They try to evoke things. Right. Um, Why is it blinking now? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but then, but then you shouldn't put it, it doesn't need a tongue. It, it, 
it's uh, it's not supposed to look like it's really there. It's supposed to look like it's, um, again, evoking, um, you know, putting me in mind of something. But then I'm supposed to p- supply that myself. And then when it starts blinking, it's like uh, it's momentarily applying a completely different aesthetic. And I can't interact with it anymore because I'm too busy swinging wildly from these two different things. Um, and I, I can't function in the way I'm supposed to function as an audience member, which is sort of interpreting and relating to it in an, in an emotional sense. I'm imagining you like traumatized watching these movies. <laughs> I, just, I, I just had this comedic image of, of you just like you know, sort of doing this while, while, while yeah, you know, Jar Jar Binks goes across the... <laughs> Well, and, and it kept happening to me. It, it wasn't just like, uh, you poor man, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the poor and the poor everybody else, because apparently this is happening to other people too. Um. So, yeah. So that's. Do you think really- that this is incompetence, or do you think that these people think they're doing something that can't be done, or you know what I mean? I, I guess what I'm asking is. Is this an example of trying to pull something off that's not working, or is this a matter of sort of not understanding something, or is this a matter of just bad execution? I think it's like why don't um, the Hobbit films work? I mean, it's the same damn guy, right? I mean, it's 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 not like he but, uh, forgot what this stuff meant or how it worked. He lost creative control, and so that one was really directed by the studio. Um, actually, I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't aware. Yeah. Of that. I know he didn't want to do it initially, but I didn't know that he actually didn't really wind up directing it. I, is, well, I mean, he directed it, but um, there was a lot of he, the studio was making. Yeah, there was a lot of interference, and um, it had to do with the amount of money that was involved. And um, there is actually uh, Lindsay Ellis did a whole exploration of the troubled production and. Um, the the cast was told one thing at one point and then it was clear that he things were moving in a different direction and uh it's it so uh i mean part of what was wrong with that movie was they just used too much cg and um yeah and they used it in 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 the arrogant kind of way where Smaug in particular was, um, we're pretty much, it was not sort of used in that subtle way like Gollum was, where they yeah. didn't want to use it more than they had to. Smaug was, was really was, underwhelming. I was really, really um, disappointed. I don't know if you ever, if you remember, if you ever watched, there was a, there's a much older, it's a cult movie. It's oh, an, the old, uh, the animated one? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not even thinking about Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay. A different film entirely. There's a film from the 80s called Dragon Slayer. Um, um, it's an obscure film. But the dragon there, it's all practical effects, obviously. And, and the dragon there is, I found, incredibly intimidating and, 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 and conveyed the right. And I don't even think you ever see the whole thing. You just see its sort of head and stuff like that. It's shot in a very smart way. But um, I found, you know, the thing with Smog, he was, the problem is Smog was so underwhelming because he was CGI'd. I mean, it just didn't have, somehow it lacked uh, impact, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, he didn't feel real uh, in quite the way he was supposed to. Um, Also, nobody seemed to get really scared of him. Um, and and the and the action set pieces were so absurd. Yes, they almost tried to turn Lord of the Rings into a superhero movie, right? And yes, so, and so it diminished the impact of everything. Right? The barrel rider scene was a classic example of it's that. Terrible. Yeah, it, it's it was the Matrix. Like it was. Uh, we had some technical difficulties. You may not even notice the cut uh, to the people in the audience um, because you know it was same day, same room, same clothes. But for us, it's uh, it's been it's been about a half hour. So I'm just going to reorient us um, um, for our sake. Um, David, you you articulated this sort of Lacanian principle about about 
sort of mixed messaging and perception, mm-hmm. creating a kind of at least having the potential to create a jarring experience to pull a person out of an experience that you that you're wanting to apply um, aesthetic and aste- aesthetically in the with regard to the question of the use of practical and visual, i.e. cheesy idea effects. We've talked through a number of examples where we think it works, where we think it doesn't work. Um, one of the last things that we were talking about before we, we had our technical difficulties was I had said that it might be tempting to say that um, it works when you're dealing with fantastical, unreal things to begin with, and it doesn't work when it's sort of try to do it in a more, gra- in, in a more uh, realistic context. But that that obviously can't be the the principle of work because there's fantasy films where it doesn't work. We talked about the Hobbit. Uh, part of the problem there also is that the CGI is used too much. Uh, we talked about um, we talked about uh, Phantom Menace and Jar Jar Binks and and why that doesn't work. Um, I'd like to now, as we're getting towards the end, I'd like to I'd like to talk about um, why it doesn't work in The Irishman. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about why you think it does not work in the Irishman. And then maybe we can wrap up with a rearticulation of what you take to be the application of what we're calling the Lacanian principle aesthetically with regard to effects. I, I, the Irishman is a film narratively and in many ways, stylistically that's um, extremely realistic. Um, maybe as realistic a sort of film as he's done since Raging Bull. I agree. It's more realistic than any of his gangster movies going all the way back, except I would say Mean Streets is similarly realistic, but everything in between was much more stylized and much more um, romanticized to a certain degree. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, people called it the anti Goodfellas. Uh, There's a, you know, just as a an aside, um, or an instance of this, uh, there's a scene where um, there's a tense meeting between De Niro's character and uh, Mafia boss. And he says, who owns an interest in this uh, laundry place that they're talking about, that they have money in? And he said, or... Um, do you know who the other parties are that have an interest in the, and he said, I do. And he said, okay, well, who is it? And he said, no, not, I know I have the money in the business. So there's just like a little under misunderstanding that might not, that doesn't really mean anything, but it's just put in for the sake of realism that, you know, when people talk, it's not all real snappy dialogue. Like yeah. it is in, uh, you know, a Howard Hawks movie or a Marvel movie where people have snappy one-liners and rejoiners for everything. In real life, you talk and ramble and mishear each other. And so that whole approach is, it's very, very realistic. Um, the, the story is an actual real life story about a real man who really did uh, most of these things, some of it's a little speculative, as it always is. Um, nothing romanticized, nothing sort of... Um, uh, Scorsese is a fan of the opera, and sometimes he sees his films as operatic. Um, you have those kinds of elements in Goodfellas and Casino. Um, none of that here. So uh, when suddenly you're trying to immerse yourself in this totally sort of true to life fly on the wall kind of filmmaking and your eyes can't accept what they're physically seeing. It's that horrible clash of sensibilities where um, I'm looking at his face and I know I'm supposed to be just looking at him and not really interacting with the effects. Just, I'm just, I'm just supposed to see that character. Right. But I don't, I see the effect and all I can think about 
is how it doesn't look real. And sort of all I can feel is annoyance at my inability to re relate to the characters and the actors and what's going on. No, it, it, it doesn't just not look real. It also, I think the scene that most people have picked upon that really c communicates how it doesn't work is the scene where he goes to beat the crap out of the storekeeper who, I don't know, was, in, was not nice to his daughter or something. And it's supposed to be a young man kicking the crap out of this guy. And it's very obviously an old man kicking the yeah. crap out of this guy because of the way he moves. Right. And, which can't be covered up with the, with the de-aging technology. And so there's a, even to the point of it's jarring in the cla in the, in that even more so you could say there's a, there's a direct example of the kind of clash of intention that you're talking about, not just realism and anti-realism, but old guy and young guy, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, here's a guy who looks like a young guy who's acting like an old guy, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, and um, um, so, so there's a very straight, literal example of the mixed messaging. Um, um, let me ask you, though, in terms of, and maybe this is a technical question that you won't know the answer to. I don't know how well you know the technology, but why do you think it is that so much earlier at a more primitive stage of the technology, Andy Serkis, all of his emoting and expression made it through the CGI, and in The Irishman, it somehow doesn't. Do you have a thought about, is that just a failure of execution, or do you think there's something fundamentally different about the kind of expression? Or I felt like Circus got through the CGI. His performance got through, and I didn't feel a lot of the times like, like um, uh, De Niro and Pesci's performances got through the CGI. I think that's mainly just a difference of... Um the material really is, uh, you know, uh, Gollum is a highly emotional character. He's often Very sometimes overstated. Yeah. yeah. He's sometimes exuberant. Sometimes he's, um, ex you know, extremely miserable or angry. He hates it. You know, I hate yes. it. I hate it. Yes. Um, sometimes he's ex agonized and torn. Um, but he's Where's always, the, the Irishman's very subtle. Very, very subtle, and uh, nobody really gets upset. And the scenes that do work, um, because we have both actors really playing their own age, um, those late scenes, um, there's still a lot of subtext, but, um, you know, there's a point at, at which it becomes clear that... Um, they're going to betray their old friend, Jimmy Hoffa. And, um, you know, De Niro doesn't want to do this, but he's, you know, having to accept that this is going to happen and there's nothing he can do to stop it. And, you know, uh, obviously the Joe Pesci character, he knows that he's going to be resistant and he's forcing him to do this thing. And, in those scenes, they're not really talking about much. They're kind of going through their day. They're they're on a road trip. They're eating breakfast. They're you know back in the kitchen. But you see those very subtle shifts in emotion where, even while they're not talking about them, De Niro's clear. The De Niro character is clearly saying, "Please don't make me do this." And through his physicality, the Pesci character is saying, "No." I'm going to make you do this. And it's a really harsh, firm um, uh, kind of uh, tough message to deliver to his old friend. And um, there's a, a sort of gangster menace that he has to bring to make it clear to him that this is not something he's going to back down from. And in the early scenes, the emotion that should be there um, would be even more subtle because these guys are don't know each other and they're wary of each other and they're um, just getting you know getting on intimate terms slowly eating eating bread and drinking wine and um, over dinner and you know going to the bowling alley these are kinds of you should 
See, and you can kind of see the growing warmth, but you're looking for something very subtle there, the, the little changes. And um, it's very hard to get down to that. For when, the CGI, yeah. Yeah, when somebody's in between you and the actor, filtering whatever decisions they made, uh, whatever play of expression, whatever gesture, whatever has all been changed before uh, or after he sent it and before it got to me. Um, so it's really tough um, to, to kind it's of... Such a, and it's such a shame in another way, right? This was the first time mm-hmm. Scorsese had actually used Pesci against his type, right? In other words, in both Goodfellas and Casino, the Pesci gangster is a very aggressive, over-the-top... Mm-hmm you know, um, um, overstated sort of character. And it was so amazing to see him convey menace in the opposite manner. Yeah. And the goddamn CGI kind of blew it a little bit. Right. I mean, I mean, I, I didn't totally listen. My overall review rating of the film is still very high. Um, 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 but I would put it in a tier below mean streets, Goodfellas and Casino, whereas I think otherwise it would have been above all of them. I think, I think, I think arguably, if only because of Pesci's performance, which is so damn good, he mm-hmm. conveys menace doing almost nothing, which mm-hmm. I find, uh, I find incredibly effective. Um, but it was marred, uh, by the scene. I actually think if you'd used the de-aging CG, the aging CGI in Casino or Goodfellas, it would have been less distracting. Precisely mm-hmm. because there was more of an element of romanticized, mm-hmm. over-the-top stylization that it mm-hmm. wouldn't have been so jarring, um, um, and the characters were so many of them were so overstated, um, um, a big production and all of that. Um, um, uh, but in this film, it really, it really, it really hurt it. I think, um, and um, I don't know. I know Scorsese's been interviewed about it. Mm-hmm. I have not seen him express any after reservations. Have you? Do you know if he's expressed any reservations? Like, ah, oh, I wish I hadn't done that sort of thing, or has he said? Uh, it? Not that I've heard. Um, yeah, yeah. I hope. I God, I really hope this doesn't become a trend. Although you know it's going to. Um, um, it's now becoming very familiar for studios to start de aging. Uh, uh, Tom Cruise has had it a lot because he's getting up there now. I think he's going to hit 60, but he's playing against much younger women, and they're giving him... I mean, you can see photographs of what his real shirtless body looks like and the, what eventually appears on um, on the screen, and it's very different. And uh, Oh, God. You know... I- it's just a shame in so many ways. I, I, you know, I said earlier that I think it's lazy mm-hmm. and it really does just sort of close off so many opportunities to display skill mm-hmm. in the cinematic frame. Right. I mean, one skill is the ability both as a director and as a performer to be a different actor who's playing a younger car. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, 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 that requires skill both in, in everything from everything in writing to acting to directing to, to and all that now we don't have to worry about we can just we can just make you look younger um um yeah look at what, um what's going to happen to all of our great makeup and practical effects geniuses right is that whole aspect of filmmaking going to disappear i mean i really i don't I think hate so. the overuse of technology it seems to me um I mean, there have been, um, yeah, uh, as to acting young, um, Better Call Saul has been a great, the the lead character, because they went back and told the story before Breaking Bad, which ended a while back. He, the Bob Odenkirk is really much older than his character, but I never feel it. In that, because just and what the did they use there? Did they use just makeup and practical aesthetics? Yeah, just just makeup, and I think they gave him some more hair. But they um, mostly it's just the physical acting. Is he really makes an effort to move and 
you know, walk around the room like a younger man. And it's, uh, I just, I almost, I almost want to say that I kind of wish that they just wouldn't use these. I mean, I know we said that this isn't the fault, the fault line, but I almost kind of really wish that they wouldn't use these in anything but science fiction and action. And I have to tell you, even there, I feel a little bit like we're just using it because we have it, not because it's better. I mean, I'm going to say this and you tell me what you think of this. In my opinion, 2001 A Space Odyssey still looks better than most of the new science fiction films that are made. In other words, all that added expense and technology, it does not look more realistic. It does not look better. Um, there's, I, I think the effects on that movie, if you look at it today, it could have been made yesterday, right, in terms of there's nothing other than the styles, the fashions, that there's nothing dated in how it looks. And that was made in 1969, for God's sake. Mm-hmm. Why are we doing this? Yeah, I think there has been in recent years more of an appreciation for practical effects. And The Dark Crystal, my criticisms aside, kind of speaks to that. Um, you mean the uh, fact that they have puppets at all, that the whole thing isn't CGI? Yeah, and that they clearly went back and built a whole bunch of sets and built a whole bunch. It's not just that they did puppets. Um, they're you know, they did something very ambitious and um, really emphasized practical effects. And um, the, the the first Star Wars movie of the new trilogy, the, what was it called? Uh, um, uh, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> you can see how little of an impact the whole that whole yeah, right. trilogy had on me. Force Awakens. Force Awakens, they, they went back and did a whole lot of practical effects, uh, including BB-8 is a real physical thing that they rolled around, and they really put Daisy Ridley in the desert. And, uh, you know, there's an appreciation for those kinds of uh, techniques that um, is asserting itself. I think it's, it's not kind of in the... Um, the Star Trek movies too, with whatever problems I had with those, they, they clearly wanted to kind of get that old feel of here's a person who we've just painted a different color and there's nothing digital about it. They're right there and you can kind of feel it. So um, it'll be interesting to see. Um, And I do uh, appreciate the sort of things you Within that fantasy sort of subgenre, um, it's been really fun to watch. Uh, you know, when uh, in the second Avengers movie, the big giant Iron Man suit, the Hulkbuster suit, is fighting with the Hulk, and it's all just totally created <laughs> ex nihilo. Um, we're not seeing anything that was really physically there, but it was in found it incredibly engaging and visceral and um, enjoyable. And that's stuff you couldn't, you couldn't have done in 1969 because that stuff, uh, it's just yeah. too, too elaborate to uh, the yeah. kind of motion you would need and to build on that size. It just couldn't be done. Uh, yeah, no, I guess, look, we should, we could argue at the margins on this. I mean, I, I think probably if we spent six hours talking about this, it would turn out that I am less likely to be happy with how it looks than you. And maybe, you know, yes, I thought some of those scenes within, in, the, in the Avengers movies where it's all CGI are, are power, you know, are, are, are relatively strong because, and there are things that you just simply couldn't do with practical effects. But I do still think they don't have quite the impact of, you know, watching a battle, you know, a fight in, you know, in Spartacus or in, or in, or in, uh, you know, or in, or in Gladiator, let's say, or, 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 um, um, and I, you know, and I guess maybe just in general, I'm sort of morally and philosophically not thrilled with the kind of the, the, the application of computers to everything. Um, I, I actually, 
wonder maybe well this is the last thing we'll talk about because otherwise you're going to go very long but i actually felt a little bit of a whiff when you first broached this with me and reading through your outline a little bit of a whiff of of some of the themes that were involved in our discussion of television and cinema Mm -hmm. i feel a little bit like we've become completely intolerant to the idea that there are distinctive virtues of distinctive media and they should remain distinctive in other words Mm -hmm. We didn't. We all of a sudden it became the case that we didn't like the fact that we had television and movies. Everything should be like a movie, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so you lost all of the distinctive virtues of television because you basically turned television into movies, right? Um, 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 even down to the pacing and the, the having it be episodic and not and not binge watching mm-hmm. it and all this sort of things. And I almost feel a little bit like there's something similar here. It's like movies are artifice. <laughs> Mm-hmm. it's not so bad if there's some fucking artifice, right? Not everything. It doesn't, we don't have to turn movies into the world, right? Um, mm-hmm. um, do you think a little bit that there's, that this is part of a more general trend of a kind of a narrowing or a homogenizing that reflects a kind of a lack of a appreciation for a certain kind of aesthetic diversity? I do think that sh- a lot of streaming shows run into that problem. Um, sometimes it's, I see it a lot throughout a whole series. Sometimes it's just like, um, there's one scene that I think they were trying, you know, a little scene that wishes it was on the big screen. It's going for the wrong kind of effect that you can't really do on the small screen. But also I think a lot of shows have discovered ways of, telling stories that are distinctive to those media. You were, you were saying, um, so to keep you from despair here, um, you're asking where are all the special effects people? Where are all the um, people who, you know, prop masters and stuff? Watch Walking Dead. I mean, that is as ambitious as makeup and having a whole bunch of physical people that they bring extras that they bring into the for a day and teach them how to act like zombies and get very elaborate, uh, complicated Is walking dead, all practical effects. Uh, not all, but or mostly vast major- Yeah. Vast, vast majority. Yeah. And, um, I haven't watched the show. So I'm not, now that you say that I'm going to, zombies are not normally my thing. So, but, but, um, I'll watch or, it for that reason. I love um, uh, the three seasons of um, Daredevil where they, they put stunts, the joy of stunts and choreography in that show is uh, wonderful. I've there read that it has scene, the best small-scale fight scenes of any. There is a scene where um, Bullseye and Daredevil are fighting in the third, the superb third season of um, <clears throat> um, Daredevil, which, honest to God, I will put up with the chariot scene in Ben-Hur and anything else as it's my my favorite stunts where these two uh, characters are fighting and it's really long and um, Daredevil's better at fighting up close and um, the other guys Much better from a distance. Yeah. But bullseyes get better for distance. So the tables turn and we see them realizing their relative advantages and reacting to each other with that in mind. Yeah. Trying to thinking, manipulate the yeah. situation so that it favors their, that's, that's, and it, and it, it goes on and on and then it finally comes to a resolution and it's, just great. It's fantastic. And there are other scenes in that show. Some of the stuff they did in the second... Oh, there's a scene where the introduction of Bullseye is just him making his way through a whole bunch of armed terrorists and just uh, picking them off with the gun. And it's so beautifully shot. And we're seeing it from the perspective of somebody in a car huddling. Uh, and then this guy's going to come and save us. And it's... it's um, that's when the, the special streaming aesthetic really works, when they find the, the kinds of things that do really work well on the small screen. 
um, and uh, stick to that, then that that really ends up working well. And it's I suppose it's trying to turn TV superheroes into an Avengers movie. They yes. do it in a way that's suitable to the to the medium and 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 more practical effects and costumes and makeup and less probably very little yes. CGI, right? Um, um, and right. something like Daredevil. Um, and there's um, a, there's a fair amount of that out there. Yeah. So yeah. that's good. Um, there's there is one last thing I want to take. Yes, on. please. Why don't you finish this off with whatever you've got it's, last? Because when you realize what the real problem is between the real seeming and the imaginary seeming objects, you realize that it's just an incidental fact that uh, the clash often occurs when digital and practical are put together. You can generate the clash deliberately or not on um, with just practical effects or mm. with just digital effects. You could have so it's contingent. Digital. It's not essential to the the digital practical interaction. It's just very easy to happen in the digital too. Right. So you you yeah. give an example of it happening where there, you're just talking purely in the realm of practical effects. Yeah. So I was talking about the sort of fantastic nature of Thanos' armor, and it's very stylized and aestheticized. Um, so is Thor's. And, you know, that's Chris Hemsworth, the real guy. He's really physically there. He's really wearing prop armor. But it's also fantastic and um, – of a piece with Thanos. And if you, if you take him out of that, you know, the Nordic God with, um, mm. the I remember this from our armor. private conversation. Yeah. yeah go on. And, this is a fascinating and, point. And they sometimes do this. If you have, you know, the God of thunder sitting on a city bus next to, you know, somebody who's just going to work and is in, you know, sneakers and jeans, he looks ridiculous. Yeah. It, it, you, you said that about the first film. You think that this happens in the first film. Yeah. There's the famous scene where he demands um, another beer and he, he smashes the bottle on the ground. Cause you realize in that moment that he should be in a great, Beer hall with roaring yeah. fire. I think it was coffee. Up. Wasn't it a coffee mug? Maybe it was. Yeah, coffee they mug. were in a diner. I think. Yeah. Although yeah. he's not wearing the costume, there is he? Uh it almost doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter really. He, he's, he's, it's he is in that moment the great god of yeah. Valhalla, and he there he is sitting in a diner. So with pure practical effects, you can create the kind of clash for comic effect. Right, and there it's and on we were purpose, t- and it works because you, yeah. it's supposed to be jarring. Yeah, there's a dramatic <laughs> intention, um, is in this case a comic intention, that it's supposed to strike you as weird. And conceivably, I don't know if I have a great example for a digital-digital clash. Um, but no, but the point is it. really interesting. What you're really saying is that, look, this is a species of a much more general, well-known artistic problem, and that is when contradictions work against you and when they work for you. Right. I mean, and, right, and, and yeah. it takes a skill to use contradictions in a way that they work for you rather than against you. Right. Right. Exactly. And, um, uh, you know, we started out thinking of, you know, when I first sort of started this investigation and when I was first having that sensation in my brain, just watching Star Trek, uh, you know, on the couch. I thought it was just the two things sort of created an almost like physical clash. Like when you put two clashing colors together, it's just those two things don't work together. But I realized more, it's not anything about the physic, the way it physically looks. It's the narrativity mm. of the objects on screen, the narrative properties more than the visual properties that are really clashing. Right. It's not that the way they, they look doesn't go together so much as the kind of story they're telling isn't going together. 
Um, some some of the you can tell stories in an imaginary way or in a more realistic way, but when you try to do both at once, you can have this problem in a non-visual medium. You can have this problem in literature, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. You um, know, does um, does somebody seem too fantastic in a realistic novel, or the reverse? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. The pure elements of narrative can have these kinds of clash with when they're trying to engage you in two different ways. Yeah. 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 Well, this is great stuff, David. Um, um, are you, are you going to write on this? Is this something you want to, or is this something that you're satisfied? You said sa- this is a, a thought thing you've worked through now and you're satisfied with it or. Yeah. Now, uh, when I have that feeling again, I will know what it is. And <laughs> so will anybody else who listened to this. So, yeah, no, the, I've said what I had to say. Um, well, thank you, David. Um, um, I didn't mention, by the way, I'm trying more and more as I do these things to sort of at the end just t- talk a little bit about what else the people are doing. I forgot to say at the beginning, you're, are you, you're not writing for Arc Digital, is that correct? Uh, well, I've submitted a few things there. I'll probably do that again. I don't have a permanent relationship technically, but yeah, look out for me. Yeah, well, I'm going to ask you to link to those also because uh, okay. so people can see you elsewhere. Um, um, thank you so much. And um, uh, it's been too long, and I hope it won't be as long the next time. Um, well, we're already working on the rest of them. Um, so but- <laughs> we're keeping them well larded. There's a big backlog. That's a lot of right. people making dialogues in That's a pandemic. That's right. That's right. People should know in the audience. I don't know if people realize this, but you know, I have like four in the can now. Um, <laughs> um, and and it's because of COVID. You know, for a number of reasons, everyone has more time on their hands. There's more. To, there's things to talk about that there weren't before. And so there is blogging has, has quite a substantial buildup. Um, so some of my, I mean, I've did one with Milton Lawson that uh, on, on the, the star Trek's uh, on discovery and Picard and on the question of franchise continuity. I think I did that like a month ago. And so people in the audience just realize that the way stuff is coming out, they're, they're coming out as fast as it makes sense to put them out and that there are substantial backlogs. So um, this will probably air sometime well after we filmed it. Um, um, so if people look at the dates at the bomb and say, holy crap, this took five weeks to come out. That's the reason. So, um, anyway, David, take care, stay well, stay COVID free. And, uh, we'll see you the next time around. All right. All take right. Care, my friend. Take care.